Thanks for coming today. Chad and I have a relatively short introduction on OER, so there should be plenty of time for questions at the end. And we'll start with the definition of OER. So defining open educational resources is something that, I mean, there's not like one definition. So the definition that the campus task force has decided upon is that open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. OER include full courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, software, and any other tools, materials, or techniques used to support access to knowledge. So that's, that's pretty good, big. Um, it's a commonly used definition of open educational resources. You can see it's adapted from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. So let's start by unpacking what open means. So there are two kinds of materials that we might use that don't cost our students money. One is free and the other is open. Materials that you might use in class that are free are websites, professional organization guidelines, YouTube videos, TED Talks, or materials available through the library. So these are free to the student, but they are not considered open. Because uh, they are under traditional copyright and at least in the case of library materials, have been paid for at some point by the institution. So open means at the very least that you have the right to retain a copy of a work and to reuse it as you wish. Well, not as you wish, to reuse it as it is without a cost. So copies of content can be retained for personal archives or reference, so you can keep one on your computer forever. It's not going to go away. That's not always the case, for example, with um, ebooks that you might check out from a library. Often they have a loan period, so they might, the files might become inaccessible at some point, depending on the agreement that the library has with the vendor of the ebook. Reused means that you can use the content as it is in its unaltered original format. So you could use it in a class, you could use it in a study group, on a website, in a video. Um, the, the stipulation being that it just can't be changed. Being able to revise and remix allows you to personalize this open content in a way that makes it especially useful or particularly useful to you. So maybe you find an, uh, a part of a lecture that is relevant to your course materials, um, but really only 10 minutes of that lecture are helpful. If the material is available openly, then you could cut out the part that was useful and use it in your class. If it's a traditional free source, then you would have to use it as it is, but specify the particular minutes that you want your students to watch. Remixing means that you can add, um, you can merge resources together to create something new. Often the new thing has to be available as an open resource, um, fulfilling all of the five R's. That's often a stipulation made by the license uh, applied by the original creator, but we'll get into that. And then the right to redistribute means you can give the, the new thing or the thing that you're using to other people without a cost. And this could include the right to commercial uses. So you could use it in a way that makes money, potentially. Open uh, also includes works that are in the public domain. So these are works that are not protected by copyright law. Most typically, the copyright has expired or the work was produced by the federal government. So you might have 
material produced by um, like the FDA, the NIH, the Department of Education. Those you can use as you wish without, in theory, attributing the resource, uh, the, the original creator, because as taxpayers, our money has paid for the creation of the work. It's in the public domain. It already belongs to all of us, so we can do what we want with it. Public domain and Creative Commons licensing are not the same. Uh, Creative Commons licensing, it, even with the most open license, will require attribution of the original creator of the work. Public domain means that no attribution is required um, and that you are free to do all the five R's with it as you wish without um, seeking permission from anyone. And there are people who release their work under a public domain license so they can waive their copyright because copyright is applied to any intellectual work once it is set into a fixed medium. So as soon as something, a lesson plan is put on paper, it is protected by copyright unless the instructor waives that right explicitly. All right. So um, in terms of the format that OER comes in, it doesn't have to be digital. Um, a really good example would be like the materials that Megan was talking about, maybe from the Department of Education. You know, they might be putting out um, lists of, you know, best practices or, you know, guidebooks or pamphlets or things like that that they want to distribute in a physical, physical medium. But because of the requirements of being able to redistribute things and remix things and revise things. Digital is kind of a natural format for OER. So a lot of a lot of the materials that you're going to see will be will be digital. Since in in our business, probably the most common OER that we run across would be things like open textbooks. Um, this can sometimes be an issue uh, with students, for instance, they might want a physical uh, a physical medium. Uh, you know, they might prefer like a physical book to have. So it's not uncommon for uh, people who write textbooks with an open license to allow for print on demand. Um, so you will sometimes see physical uh, medium, but digital is going to be pretty much the standard. All right. So in terms of what we see on campus, um, some examples that you might run across of open resources there's kind of a variety of them and of course not all of these will be open in every instance right there's all these requirements some of them might just be free but the most common examples you might see might be things like um, uh, if you're if you're getting things from canvas commons like a course shell um, because they're because they're in commons they're uh, they would be considered open um, question banks or this would be you know I, i've definitely run across things like this in mathematics uh, if you're using like online homework systems, people will create uh, question banks or test banks that you can then use and then repurpose on your own. Um, some people, when they make uh, video supplements to their work, uh, will will uh, release it as open material. But like I said, the most common instance is probably going to be open textbooks. Um, and we use a variety of these on campus. You can see a, this is by no means an exhaustive list here, but it's kind of a, a selection from across the university. We've got people using open textbooks in biology, in information systems, in astronomy, economics, um, information literacy, uh, instructional design, um, you know, a, a variety of stuff. Uh, one of these, MA240, the Mathematical Reasoning Book, is a class that I'm teaching right now. Um, and the book that I'm using was written at GBSU, it's Grand Valley State University, and they have a, um, a history of creating open resources uh, there. So I've used several of their works. Okay, so if you are someone who is interested in, uh, you know, getting into OER, if you find the prospect of using these free and revisable materials attractive. The first question is often like, where do I go to find it? Um, in my case, uh, when I was first being introduced to this idea, um, it was through people that I had met through 
you know, through work, through networking, through conferences, that sort of thing. In a lot of cases, it was people who were making these uh, these resources, or sometimes people who were using them themselves. And so I would I would just kind of talk with them and find out what they were doing. But as I learned more about it, one of the things that I found is there are lots of collections of these things available. Like if you want to go out and find resources that you can use, there are plenty of places where you can look. And so a selection of them is here. Uh, the open textbook library is something that you can um, you can some place where you can go to look for OER. Kbor is a member, so we have access to that. OpenStax, I've you they have just uh, a list of very sort of standard textbooks for a lot of different disciplines. I've used their books in previous classes. OER Commons, Teaching Commons. Um, the Kbor website has a list that you can look at to find some of these repositories where if you just want to find something either to build an entire class around or just something to supplement what you're already doing, um, you can go check it out there. And then um, beyond just finding resources, if you're interested in sort of going deeper and studying a little more about like, um, you know, uh, what are some guidelines for using or creating OER? Um, how effective is OER in the classroom versus uh, traditional uh, textbooks? You know, what are, what, are the, what are the benefits that students or faculty might see? There are also resources that you can go to for that. Um, so here's a, here's a list of those. Um, the first two are from UNESCO, which you guys probably have more experience with it than I do. Um, I, for anyone like me who didn't know what that was, that's the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Um, so this is, you know, pretty high level stuff. They're, uh, they're printing out, you know, basic guides or guidelines for, for using OER. KBOR has information um, and, like I said before, lists of uh, resources that you can find. And this fourth one here is a, um, uh, an update on Ohio Links Affordable Textbooks Initiative. And that had, at least when I looked at it, that had more, like, um, information about effectiveness, like how effective that program had been. So there are definitely places you can go to, to learn more about, you know, beyond just finding stuff, learning more about OER in general. And um, I think that that kind of wraps up our like, you know, here's here's what OER is and here's where you can find it. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we had a lot of time to get kind of a dialogue going. So. Um, Megan is more of the expert on this stuff. She she knows a lot about you know the ins and outs in OER. Of OER. I'm more of a newcomer. Um, I've been using it in my classes for the last few years, um, and I've had a little experience with trying to create some of my own, which has been um, fun and challenging. So um, we'd be happy to share any any of our perspectives and any of our expertise and answer whatever questions you've got. One of the things that I was really interested in was that you talked about um, Canvas course shells. So I always knew that we had the Canvas Commons, um, but do you know or have you used um, any of the shells? I personally have not. I tend to be um, just kind of create my own every time I, I want to build a class. I have um, I knew that the course shells existed, and I know that there are people who do a lot of sharing uh, of stuff. Um, maybe it's just a cultural thing. Uh, math people tend to be kind of set in our ways, and it's like, no, I just do it the way that I always want to do it. So uh, I haven't spent a lot of time looking around there. I don't know if anyone else around here has. Um, I actually use an OER for my microbiology class, and I looked at their course shell for the textbook and didn't actually use that one. I stuck with the ESU's um, Canvas uh, shell, but I was able to import from that one all the links they have to the different reading chapters from the OER, and I found that very helpful. Thank you. That's a great idea. I also forget that we can just pick and choose the parts that we pull into our courses, so that's really good to know. Yeah, that's one of the real advantages of OER materials is that you can kind of adapt it to your own needs. And this is Michelle Hammond, also from the library. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Chad. This is very, very helpful. Um, 
just wanted to add a resource that the library has in place uh, called Faculty Select. And I'm going to share, if I can, my screen very quickly. Faculty Select acts as an interface that allows you to discover. It's more like a, it has a lot of uses, but one of its primary uses, it's a discovery tool for OER content. So instead of you going into each of the individual places that Megan and Chad shared with you, you can use Faculty Select to search through a number of OER platforms, and they include uh, many that, uh, I think those that Chad mentioned, and also this list is actually an, an older uh, presentation uh, that I have, but they've opened this list to a number of other platforms. So this is um, an integrated way to search for materials that are open from many of the, the open platforms that are out there. So I just wanted to share that. We have that available. And um, we would also like to utilize that platform so that we can manage statistics across campus in terms of how much we have and that we're using that is open. So please feel free to reach out to, to Megan or myself if you have any questions or would like a training session uh, around faculty select. Could you include a link to that in the chat, please? Sure, Megan, um, you have that available by chance. Um, it is in our, we will definitely do that for you, Christy. Um, but we also have it available in our databases list. If you ever lose that link that we will provide, if you go to your databases link from our website and go to F, and get to faculty select, it can be found there as well. But thank you for asking. I should also mention one of the things that I found really helpful in terms of like seeing what's out there and seeing what I might want to use has been um, just sort of networks of people who are doing the same thing. Um, there are a lot of people on math Twitter, for instance, who uh, are creating or sharing resources that they've that they've made, and it kind of helps me keep up to date on like, hey, when there's a, you know, a new a new book by someone that I you know that I already know that's coming out that I might want to that I might want to really try out, or someone's developing a software package that can help with things like that. So, um, if you're interested in doing doing new things with your classroom, you know, Im implementing OER, it can really help to find people who are already doing that and just kind of get into the loop with them too. So Chad, you said you've been also building, like making your own OER. Yes. Do you mind kind of telling us some of your experiences, maybe what you're doing, how it's sure. been? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, so I, I got on uh, the, the OER committee because I was a recipient of a Craig grant. Um, this past year, and my proposal was something that I had been thinking about for a very long time. I have a class that I teach in our graduate program. Uh, it's our intro level graduate course. Uh, it's meant to kind of get students up to speed if they've been out of the math loop for a while before they before they take uh, take on more complicated courses. And I've really enjoyed that course, and I tinkered with a lot. But one of the things I always struggled with was finding a good book or a good set of books because there were I, I would always have books that I liked, but there were things about them that I didn't like, and some were more expensive than others, and uh, it was a lot of stuff to balance. And I always had this idea in my mind that you know it would be nice if I just like had my own notes that I could just give students, and they were just set up the way I want. And so I saw this uh, I saw this um, this grant idea, and I had a colleague who was interested, although she ended up she ended up leaving the university for uh, for other reasons. So it ended up just being sort of my project. And I thought, well, you now this is the time to do it. And um, so at the moment I have, I have a sort of partial, uh, a partial set. Uh, I have notes that cover the, the material that was a paid book. I also have a second half of the course that was using a, an open book. So that, that part is, was open already. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's been, um, it's been a challenge. That'd be the definite first thing I would say. Cause this is my first time at writing 
anything like I'm not even willing to call it a book at this point just because like it, it's it's too rough draft at this point it's it's just notes that I give my students um, but it's been really nice being able to incorporate stuff that I previously would have had to do in like class meetings or in supplements like I would I would or in videos where I'd always say you know I'm, I'm kind of putting my spin on the things that the author is talking about and now I can just make that the primary the primary text um, because of the scale of the project it's been it's been tough like I I was planning on getting it done before the semester started and of course that didn't happen so <laughs> it was kind of writing things as I went um, but I plan to keep going with it. I want to. I want to expand it and make it. Uh, make it a full thing. And I definitely want to. Once I. Once I feel comfortable enough with it that I. I want to like make it available to other people if they want to use it. I definitely want to make it an open project. Let people take what they want from it. And if they have a better way of phrasing something, if they can figure out how to explain this thing that I can never quite figure out how to explain, you know, let them. Let them. You know, do a better job than I can. But. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been very rewarding. I've been I've been really, despite the despite the pressure of doing it, I, I've I've found it like to be really enjoyable, and I feel really good about what I've produced so far. So Chad and Megan, um, one of the one of the arguments put out by the UNESCO group um, for OER is, I mean, not just the cost savings initiative for students, but that it puts faculty more in control of their curriculum. And I'm just wondering, especially with you, Chad, um, since this is kind of a, a daily occurrence for you now, if, if that has been true, if you've noticed any substantive changes in your teaching? Um, I will say I can think of some very specific examples where I think that's very much true. Um, I had one of my first experiences with OER was at a conference um, where the speaker had written an OER textbook. And the really cool thing about it was it was very much oriented toward active learning. Um, this was for a calculus class and calculus, it's almost a, a joke in math circles that all calculus textbooks are the same. Like the, it's just like you change the numbers in the, in the exercises, but they're all, they're all, they all cover the same material. And this one, I think, was really different in the way it presented things. It was much more geared toward how the author wanted things to run in the classroom, like how they thought students would work best, you know, working in groups and having the having the uh, professor like be a, a supportive presence rather than just like a, a lecturing presence. And I think that's a lot easier in open in uh, with open textbooks because you know, if you're going through a publisher, they're going to be much more averse to trying more exotic things like that, you know, they know what, what they've seen to work and they're going to want to, they're going to want to do more of the same. So it, there are, there are definite examples I can think of where it's much more freeing to be able to just make your own thing. Um, the librarians have been working on creating an open textbook for information literacy. We currently use one. Um, it approaches the concept of information liter literacy through uh, a pillars framework. But the American Library Association has sort of redone their approach on information literacy skills and, and developed a framework, the ACRL framework. So they're, they're two frameworks, they're just different frameworks. And so we were writing a new textbook to go with the ACRL framework um, because it encourages, you know, particular dispositions, for example, when it comes to interacting with information or pursuing an answer to a question, and, and not just concrete skills, because we all know that like dispositions are hard to measure. Um, so, so that's one, one way that, that it would give us more uh, control over our content. Now, that's not necessarily the way that I would structure it if I were writing a book for my class, but <laughs> um, but it's the way that the librarians as a whole have agreed that it's helpful to approach in a way that aligns with professional um, norms and and expectations. So, um, so yes, one day when that's finished, we will get to redo our class. Um, I don't really, there isn't really a textbook for information literacy. So, you know, we don't, 
we don't have some of the established problems that like math does, for example. Um, it's just, there's so much to look at. Like, do I want to use this little book or that little book or, but we could just, you know, write a book that matches with the way we already teach the course. And that's, I mean, there, there are good things about that, but also, you know, you, I would say the downside is you have to remember, even when you write your own textbook, you can't stop looking at what other people make, right? Because you need to be constantly refining your textbook or your teaching or whatever. So that's maybe the trap that some people might fall into is that, oh, I've written my own book, it's exactly what I want, and I don't ever need to look at anything else. Well, that's not true. As librarians, we don't we don't necessarily fall into that trap because we look at new things all the time. That's our job. But I can see where if you're very busy teaching a four four load with you know 200 students or whatever, um, it might be more of a challenge to push yourself to stay open. Yeah, I I agree. That's uh, I think it's sort of a, a benefit and a cost. Um, like I know I had a colleague who was using an open textbook and his students um, collected just over the course of the semester just like found so many like uh, like errors or, or, or typos or things just like they, they were just a wonderful proofreading resource and he was able to just send those to the author and the author just oh oh yeah this is this is great I'll just get all these fixed and they were just like fixed immediately um, you know the wrong symbol in the wrong place or something like that and so uh, you know, kind of extrapolating from that, the open open nature means that it's a lot easier to update and, you know, keep material current, but then that does come with the cost of, like, you can't ever just say, it's done, I'm never, I'm not touching it <laughs> again, like, if you want to, if you want to really keep it relevant, you do have to, like, keep, keep tinkering with it. So I know that Jasmine um, had mentioned that she's, has collaborated, like, across institutions, um, have either of you done work with someone outside of ESU where you're like trying to pull ideas or create something together? I haven't yet, but I think I think there's a reasonable chance that I end up doing that on this on this current project. Um, so I mentioned that I was using a book uh, that was written at Grand Valley State um, University in Michigan. I actually did a sabbatical there. Um, a little over a year ago um, because uh, part of the reason was because they had a reputation for making these really high quality um, uh, high quality resources that they would just share out uh, openly and so like right now what I've got is very sort of functional for my particular needs but if I want to expand it into being something that's that I would you know feel more comfortable sharing with you know a wider a wider audience which I eventually do want to do like that is a resource that I would want to draw on. Like they have a lot of experience doing this and they have a lot of good ideas about what, what should be emphasized. So um, I think that would probably be like my next step. This step was very much, this semester in particular was very much like, I need something that works. <laughs> I want it, that, that's step one. But yeah, I, I think it's pretty likely going forward. So how about from our audience? Does anyone have any broad, general, specific questions for Chad or Megan, or even any thoughts, anybody thinking about trying an OER and maybe haven't before? I, I just had a quick question. So I've, I've heard some mention of grants, but if they're OER, why, why is a grant necessary? So, um, I mean, in my case, the the grant is uh, is really just to support the the time for the time and energy to like create the resources in the first place. But it, it's more open than that. Like it's not um, and the grant the grant levels at least when when I applied were they vary depending on what you were planning to do. Um, like if you were if you were uh, planning on just implementing OER that someone else had created, that's probably going to be a lower a lower amount. But um, the uh but there's still going to be some effort required to like go through and and vet different sources that you want and and it, it's really mainly compensating uh the faculty's time that they have to do to kind of reorganize their course and and in in hopes of you know getting a good uh um a good product out there for students 
Yeah, as one of my podcasters recently said, this is free to you, to everyone, but it is not free to make. So if you if you want to help support the making of this podcast, yeah, yeah. And if you're if you're interested in this, the the particular grant we're talking about is the Craig Grant. Um, I found out about it just through a, um, a communication from the provost's office uh, last year, um, and it's still running. So um, keep an eye out if you're if you're interested in in doing this sort of thing. If you're interested in adopting uh, OER. Um, You'll you'll probably run across references to it, um, or you can you can ask one of us. We can point you in the right direction. Thank you. I just, I just want to clarify. Sometimes I was I was trying to think: Is it worth my effort to write the grant? <laughs> because if it's to compensate my time, then maybe I would just do the research and then skip that. Because if I didn't get the grant, then if you know what I'm saying. So I've I've had some grants work and some not and some so i'm a little um hesitant to do the investment for right. that also <laughs> yeah i i am not like a frequent grant writer like i i've gotten i've gotten some uh this one was not particularly onerous um it like uh i, I always figure if i can if i can manage it then probably other people are going to be better at it than i am so um so yeah i think it's something, definitely something you could go for if you're interested I have one note, though. Um, I understand that we are not going to encumber the budget for the incoming provost, so we are not yet sure if there is going to be uh, the resources for the Craig Grant for the fall. Um, I think it's very nice that we're going to be nice to the new provost, um, but I think it's definitely something to keep in mind. That is true, yeah. Yeah, the budget, budget issues kind of trump uh, all these all these things we have to be mindful of those i will say that i am without a grant going to adopt an open uh, textbook for my comp 2 class for the fall and um, there's for what i do there is a lot of uh, really terrific resources available um, and some of them do have exercises and you know ideas along with them um, one of the things that I've noticed, though, for English at least, is I'm going to have to curate my own reading lists. Um, that's been one of the shortcomings for comp um, for me. But on the other hand, I have lots of um, kind of textbooks that I've used in the past that are actually just reprints of articles we can already find for free. Um, you know, maybe it was like a Washington Post article or you know whatever it is. And so with just a little bit of effort, I'm going to be able to save students, you know, probably $80, $90. And honestly, that makes me happy. Yeah, I, I had used, um, even before the grants came around, before I tried making my own stuff, I had been using uh, open textbooks for a couple of years before that. Um, and depending on your discipline, um, like, in some cases, it, it almost feels like it's more of an ethical issue. Like, it, math is really bad about this. The those those calculus textbooks I mentioned that are all the same. Like, they run two or three hundred dollars, which is a lot for students. Um, some of the beefier, you know, science textbooks can be similar. And I mean, if they're all the same and there's a an open version of the same thing, it's it's uh, it's hard to justify not doing that. In a, it's a personal view, but. Um, but I think the students really appreciate it. I wanted to mention that um, if you're thinking about doing this, but you're not sure, um, the library has um, these research guides and working with our library staff to develop research guides for our class was one of the ways that I started kind of just seeing how it would work, how it could work. So if you go to your library connect and you click on research guides, you'll see an alphabetical list um, many of those have been curated by our library staff, which is it's so helpful. Um, but this is a, a source that is open for people who are at ESU. It's not open to everybody. But it's a really helpful way to kind of conceive what would this look like for my class. Um, in my area, the, the books are always going to be spotty in coverage of some elements and, and more robust in others. And there's, there's not a perfect textbook out there. 
And so materials that are in the public domain have tended to be better. Um, and it's been possible to work with students in a collaborative way to, to actually build that resource with students and have them doing the research. And, and so that's been really cool. Um, press books is another. Um, I had a student who uh, was on an ESERP grant. It wasn't a Craig grant, but she had summer research. Um, and she had planned to do a workshop for students for social aligning creative writing activities with social and emotional health learning outcomes for the state of Kansas. Um, but then we were in COVID, and so that became an OER project. And it was really revelatory to see how that material could translate into an electronic format. So um, if you have a class that you have a lot of material for already, um, that as Chad has pointed out, you just, you're not happy with some of the materials and, and you're already working there, that's the perfect place to start thinking about developing an OER. And you can, you can try some of these other mechanisms. It's just like building on a canvas shell to see how it's going to work. Um, so I would, I would definitely recommend checking out those library research guides. Thank you, Amy. That is a great one that I often forget that we have, despite the fact that I often use other libraries, library guides when I can access them. And I'll say, I, I can't say enough good things about the library staff too. Like uh, just, again, I, I'm kind of getting into this just piecemeal, but uh, like from talking to Megan and um, looking at some of the resources that the library has, like I've learned a lot about how open resources work. Like it's a, it's just like if you, if you feel like you're confused and you want to, you want to jump in and you don't know where to start, just talk to someone at the library and see what they've got. They can really help a lot. I, I want to throw in another library uh, kudo here, not just because Michelle's here, but um, we taught a comics class, uh, I guess it was last fall or the fall before. Um, Bethany O'Dell is one of our, our librarians, and there was no version of the book that we needed. And so it became a, a learning activity for the students to learn how to create that material. Um, to get the copyright, to get it into the public domain, because there was no accessible material. Comics are a, a special kind of challenge in terms of accessibility, because there's a visual and a textual element. So it was a great way to learn about accessibility and to then build that resource as a class activity. And our library actually has a space in which students can go do that. They can go learn how to do uh, alt text. They can. Um, I think the space is actually right next to uh, Bethany's office. I can't remember, Megan, I don't remember the name of it, but uh, what creative is it called? Space. The library creative space. Creative space. Yes, so that's there. In other words, you don't have to have that in your department to build that. The library already has it. Thanks for the plug, Amy. <laughs> I'm upset. I didn't know there was a class on comics. That sounds really fun. <laughs> And off the record, I think I could spend a lot of time enjoying a class on comic books. Especially having an eight-year-old. Could do it together. It'd be amazing. They're pretty radical socially. You know, there's, there's cool mm -hmm. stuff going on out there. Stan Lee was way ahead of his time. Okay. Well, I will not digress this into, or let it digress or lead the digression into comics. Um, but I will tell everyone, thank you so much for um, coming to our OE, What is OER session. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Chad, so much for being willing to facilitate and kind of lead us through this um, exploration of what open educational resources are. Um, I will make sure that we have access to and that I will send out um, links for and information about the um, slide presentation as well as for the um, Zoom itself. Um, remember there will be another session next week and then a, one the following week and other than that I hope you all have wonderful days today. Thank you.